introducing the basic principles and methods of um, um, how we, we treat, um, um, how treatment planning is, is actually done. Nicholas, uh, Nicholas, I, I welcome you. Thank you for um, being with us and I give you the floor. Yes, um, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, everybody can hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Loud and clear. perfect. Um, so I will start um, um, sharing one moment. Okay. So then, hello again, everybody. Um, let's begin. So you see, I clarified the title a little bit um, because I thought quite a long time on, on what to actually tell you in, in a treatment planning talk. Um, because I think our, our audience is kind of quite diverse. So we have um, um, people among the audience that are already um, maybe quite proficient with, with, with medical physics and what's going on. Maybe they, they have experience with photons already. So they, they, they know a lot about treatment planning. Um, some basically are new to this topic. And the problem is a little bit that treatment planning is, is huge. So it's, it's the art of, of creating a treatment plan. And um, from, from very simple times where, where people had um, no possibility of, of real imaging and they used basically films, drew lines where they expected the dose, uh, um, um, to, to the photon dose to, to be. Um, this has evolved to, to techniques um, that cannot really be covered in, in, in one and a half hour. So what I decided to do is really to give you an, 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 like really an introduction to how to do like basic treatment planning so that, bas like, that, that you would be able um, um, to, to create a very simple treatment planning tool yourself in a sense. So do, that you know what, what would be required, um, but I won't go into like all the techniques that are possible, like creating treatment plans with, with I don't know, like with, with, with knowledge-based um, atlases or creating um, Pareto fronts and so on. So this is all stuff that I won't cover, but I just will you give you like the really underlying principles. And I will do this for, for both photons and ions because um, I think the whole treatment planning started with photons, like, you know, the, 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 with conformal treatment planning and, and IMRT. And then um, at some point, uh, the particles, ions, um, hadrons, however we call them, um, came into place. And I think it's also a good thing to see both of those um, modalities side by side, um, because it always helps understanding um, um, the differences in planning um, and, and advantages and disadvantages in a sense. So this being said, um, let's um, start. Maybe I can choose the laser pointer. So um, that's a little bit uh, better. So yeah, let's first take a look at the um, general workflow of a, a radiation uh, treatment. So this is also not, there are like multiple steps intermediate. There can, loops can, can happen um, um, uh, like in the steps, but this is like, I think a broad overview. So when there is the diagnosis and, and someone decided on, 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 on doing radiotherapy on a patient, um, there are multiple steps that, that we go through. Um, and uh, like one of the first steps is um, to put the patient actually in a position that can be reproduced in imaging and in therapy. So um, that's the first thing you, you need to make sure because um, um, what we want, what we cannot do, and I, I said this yesterday, is we cannot just put the patient on the table and start treatment. So we need to plan before, that's, that's what this is about. Um, and we need to, like create a consistent environment in a sense. Um, so basically we put the patient in a position 
um, um, that we can reproduce during imaging and later um, the treatment. Um, so this is, for example, done like if you think about head and neck treatments or something like this by 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 putting a mask and a fixation device where you put the head so that you can exactly reproduce this um, in, in 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 all steps of the of the um, treatment process. And when you have this position, you first take an image, and especially this image is a um, CT image, like the standard image for treatment planning is a CT image. You can also take other images like an MR or, or, or a PET image, which helps you um, with the next step where you then um, basically find all the important organs and structures um, within the patient. So this includes that you identify the tumor volume um, and all the risky organs that, that are close to the tumor and that you want to avoid during a radiotherapy treatment. Um, so this step, and after this, you go to the things that I call treatment planning. You can basically, you could say all of this is somewhat treatment planning, but that's the step of dose calculation and optimization that you do here that I will cover in the treatment planning talk today. It's also the minimum, let's say, requirement that allows you to understand what we will do in the tutorials. And there all the, like a lot of the other aspects like imaging, there will be dedicated talks for this um, um, and so on. So, and maybe some of the, the speakers, for example, on Friday, give a little bit more um, insight in how this worked. And you already have seen like in individual visits a little bit how this is, how this whole process is is going through in, 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 a, in a therapy center maybe. So, um, but this process is really, you have an image and you basically have your segmentation um, and you go to basically create the treatment plan based on this data that you have um, and you simulate it. And afterwards you go back to real life in a sense. So you, you really verify your plan and perform the quality assurance on the machine. So you can think basically you created a treatment plan and then you really verify, for example, with a, let, let it be a film measurement or something that, that your dose that, that you planned will come out or, your, or let it be your fluence um, or those will come out of the accelerator as you planned it. Um, someone has his um, mic on. Um, so can you please turn off your mic? And participates kindly switch off their mic. Okay, I think I can even like um, mute them. Good. Um, so basically, here you verify that your plan that you created during the treatment planning step is 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 correct, and it comes out of the machine as you planned it. Um, then you basically recreate the position that you also used during imaging and irradiate the patient. And this happens in several, what we call fractions. So the patient repeatedly comes and gets a part of the dose. Um, I think uh, um, this was also already started yesterday to explain that you basically um, do this to, to allow healthy tissue to repair and, and, and tumor tissue usually um, has worse repair um, capabilities. And through this repeated fractions, you can have an additional sparing of healthy tissue while, while um, 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 uh, during ir irradiation. There's a lot of going on in, in this part. So also during the fractions, you might take new images, might take, um, might replan and so on. So this can also be a loop. There are also adaptive techniques, but um, I don't really go into those um, because I really want to understand, want, want you to understand and given the diverse audience, what the basics is of creating a treatment plan. So with which you can go to the machine and then start irradiating. Yes, so we are going to talk about this step today. So now let's think about um, what a treatment plan should do. So um, a treatment plan should basically fulfill clinical requirements. So if you are a planner, let's say medical physicist, MTA, um, you sit there and then the doctor says, okay, this patient um, needs a treatment plan. Um, 
and uh, this would be the goals that we have for this treatment plan. I discussed with the patient and, and this treatment is, for example, a palliative radiation treatment or we have curative intent and so on. Um, so there's a prescription by the physician. Um, um, but this prescription is basically not, um, 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 not uh, it's not directly giving you um, giving you what 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 the radiation does, namely it 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 induces a biological process. Um, so it kills cancer cells and it also kills healthy tissue cells. Um, so you that that's the underlying process that's somehow encoded in the prescription. Um, yes, as I said, these processes are induced by chemical and physical processes, reactions and interactions that are also not included, like they are they are not prescribed. Um, and uh, how you all have to do this is you have to do numerical simulations and, and procedures like dose calculation and optimization. So you see, you have like a lot of disciplines factoring in here. Um, and you can call this problem like, let's say an interdisciplinary inverse problem. You have something that you want to um, um, achieve, namely a good treatment plan. Um, and you need to find out how this treatment plan looks like. And you have a prescription like this. Um, um, so, um, so that's usually what you call an inverse problem, and we will find this out also from the mathematical side what this what this means. Um, so first, like a little bit about imaging. You have seen some of these pictures already, and um, I think there will be another talk that goes a lot more into imaging. Um, so basically, imaging makes the whole treatment planning possible. Of course, it started with uh, with um, the X-ray discovery. Um, by uh, Röntgen, you see the, fa the famous picture of the hand with the ring and like probably one of the fastest success, fastest success stories in, in scientific history. Um, I mean, uh, think about uh, writing a paper and getting the Nobel Prize uh, six years later, that's, that's kind of uh, high speed um, 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 that you can achieve. Um, and of course we have, um, we have uh, um, made great progress there to, to not only be able to, to make 2D images, but also like 3D images you can like, by computer tomography, um, where you basically take a series of, of simp well, quite simplified 2D images to, track it, to create a 3D X-ray. So a 3D image of, of, um, of photon attenuation in the patient. Um, so that's just the basis that we need for, for creating a treatment plan because then we have an image. So we really know something about the anatomy. As I said, there can also be other images used, um, especially for the delineation, but we'll come to that. Um, I won't show other images, but um, I think it's always good to know that we cannot only do um, 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 CTs. So we can also do MRs and PET scans. So usually you have a 3D image and it's quite difficult, difficult to really look at 3D images. Um, um, they are, uh, funnily, they are kind of like also um, a colleague of mine um, who's no longer at DKFC worked, for example, also with virtual reality um, um, and stuff so that you really have like a 3D CT you can navigate through um, conveniently. But usually what you see in a treatment planning system is or what you most of the time work with is like 2D slices of the image. So that's like a Hounsfield unit image of a CT scan. It's probably not the best window for a head and neck case, but that's the head and neck case that is included in Matrat. So you will also see it in the afternoon sessions, I presume. Um, so um, basically you have um, a pixel slice. Here it's the actual plane at like a Z of 200 millimeter given the coordinate system. And then you have like a pixelated image um, of this slice. And you can also look from other directions. And basically each pixel here corresponds to a voxel in a three-dimensional space. So you have like this three-dimensional image that you can basically scroll through um, and, and check out like how which point or like small cubic element in the image attenuates um, your photons. So it's also always important to, to realize that, that this is an image that was created based on photons. Um, and and um, 
that can that plays a role in in those calculation and treatment planning. Okay. So, but that's what you work with. And before you can go to treatment planning, that's the second step um, that I will talk about. You need to delineate volumes of interest. So you have this image um, and you really want to, to know your regions where you should take special care. So you basically create a delineation and you um, draw in contours um, um, of the certain organs. So what you can see here is for example, these structures these are um, the, the parotid glands. Um, so basically they produce your saliva and so on. These are very important organs in a head and neck treatment because um, um, losing the gland function can be a very nasty side effect from radiation treatment that you would want to avoid. So to avoid that in the treatment planning process, you need to really delineate it and know where they are. Um, same here for the brainstem or also like parts of the brain that show up here and this here would be, for example, it's it's not um, um, really visible in the CT. Um, this would be um, uh, target delineations. Here, um, um, your 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 target regions would be, um, and uh, basically, then you would um, see that this is already quite can, could be quite problematic to spare these organs when irradiating this target region. Like I'm not going into like more detail, we will, we will have more insight into these regions later on and also in the afternoon session. But that's basically the step that is, that is um, done before treatment. And when you have this, you can basically start um, planning your, your treatment. Okay, so let's take a little bit a step back and uh, stop looking at a um, nice or like a complicated, let's say head and neck patient. So we start looking at a very weird looking patient from some alien world um, where um, patients are box shaped and full of water. Um, now this is kind of a water box phantom. It's also included in Madrid. It's the TG119 phantom that is used for, for the, um, IMRT. So intensity modulated radiotherapy um, benchmarking in a sense. So um, what you see here is like this, this, this water box that lies on the treatment table. So you see there's, there's like um, the table providing the flat surface um, um, that is mounted here on the couch. And, um, and what it has, it has like a blue delineation that's standing for just the outer contour um, of the whole patient. And it has like two arbitrary um, 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 structures. So it has like the C-shaped structure, which, um, which serves as a target structure. And it has this green structure here, which I think in Madrid is called the core. It's basically just a structure simulating an, an organ at risk. It might look like a weird um, um, setup and um, there is a reason why the setup is so prominent especially for for IMRT benchmarking and we will see directly um, in a few minutes why this is the case but um, to to focus a little bit more about on this inverse problem from a a mathematical side of how to create a treatment plan um, um, let's say we know that a dose of um, 60 gray delivered in 30 fractions will um, will um, um, destroy the tumor or control the tumor, as, as you would also say. Um, and optimally, basically, then you would need to apply 60 gray to the tumor. So what, what would be the ideal dose distribution? Like, let's not think about, like, let's forget that we know how radiation works and, uh, and everything. So we just think about the mathematically ideal dose distribution for this problem. Um, usually I do it the way that I let people um, um, like guess here. I think, um, I don't know, maybe someone can, we have like a lot of people in the chat, right? We have in Zoom, we have about like 300 people or something like this. So maybe someone 
can write in the chat or something what he or she thinks is the ideal dose distribution for this case, where we have basically healthy tissue here, we have an organ at risk here, and we have a target here, and we know the target needs 60 gray um, of those, and we want to spare organs at risk and healthy tissue. What is the really ideal mathematical dose distribution? So I'm waiting for, for a guess in the chat. Let's see if something comes up. Can yes, it's the simplest, the simplest uh, um, um, things that came by Damir and Corey. I think um, it's quite easy. It's from a mathematical point of view. You really want to have sixty gray here and zero everywhere else. That's the ideal dose distribution that you would like to achieve. And anything, that's what you want to achieve, right? Um, of course, as physicists and, and all the other um, um, uh, backgrounds you have and all the lectures you already had, you know that's not possible. Radiation has to come in somewhere um, and, and go through the tissue. Um, the closest to basically, <laughs> Um, like there is there's one method like internal radiotherapy, like brachytherapy, where you basically go from the standpoint, I just put radiation there, but there you also have a decay of those to the outside. So that this is not possible, but if you think that you just want those in the target and you know exactly where your target is and so on, that would be what you really would like to achieve. So a high or let's say the prescribed dose in the tumor and zero dose everywhere else. You would not care about that this is a special organ if you could achieve this you would just like put no dose there so mathematically that's how you could describe your optimal dose distribution so but um, as we know radiation is not um, um, just um, like appearing out of thin air it has to go um, it has to come from somewhere and and it usually does not uh, or it doesn't basically um, just uh, um, vanish. It has like some kind of um, depth dependent uh, energy um, loss behavior and or energy deposition behavior in tissue. And we start with looking at a photon beam. Also with this is like the heavy iron um, um, uh, um, school, but I think it's a very good thing to start with and understand how treatment planning came to place and also why the C-shape is so, uh, so interesting. So you have a photon beam that gets attenuated. So basically using a photon beam, um, um, you would never achieve this ideal dose distribution. It's just not, not, um, not um, possible. Um, and also if you just put a source of photons there, the photon beam will come, not come out in the shape of the tumor. So the first thing to try to achieve our dose distribution is to combine a photon beam with a collimator, which puts us into the direction of, that's of something that we call conformal 3D planning. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's the most modern thing, but you see a lot of conformal um, planning. So that's not something that is not done anymore, but that's like the simplest approach in a sense um, um, that, uh, that um, that you could choose, okay? Like taking a beam and collimate it. And the collimators we use today, so these are like these multi-leaf collimators. So basically you have a device that has leaves, for example, made of some um, blocking, radiation blocking material. You could think of, um, of, I don't know, tungsten. I'm actually not 100% sure what collimators are usually made of nowadays, but um, that would be like, I guess. and. So they, they basically, you can move them into the shape of the tumor. You could also use something else. So you could use basically a, like just a pre-printed block that has exactly the shape of the projection when you know your beam angle already. So that's what you can do. Um, you adapt like a photo beam to the tumor shape and then you get something like this. And this is of course far away from, from what you want to achieve, right? Um, so what you do, I don't like want to spend a lot of time with, with this is you start by adding just more beams, more beams, more beams, more beams. And that's the old photon way of planning. So you choose beams and beams and beams. And this is what we call forward planning. So basically you, you know what you want to achieve and you try really actively 
forwardly to achieve it by um, by by doing these these things manually. So basically, what you see here, you just cho chose this collimated, always collimated to the projection, let's say, of the tumor-shaped beams, and you superimpose them, and you directly see. Um, you, you may come to understand why this C-shaped target is with this core in the middle um, is chosen um, here because you see that this method of planning makes it very hard to spare this organ. Or let's say very hard is the wrong um, situation. It makes it impossible to spare this. Um, you need to start basically taking those away here, but when you take those away here, you would also take those away here. And then you would like sit there and think, okay, now I have taken those away here. How do I compensate it? I regulate the beam up here, but it also upregulates those here. And then you need to take away those here. So, you know, it, it's, you can probably like do very simple shapes like con, um, um, convex shapes. You can irradiate with this technique for photons. But like these concave shapes, they are very difficult. And that's basically, so why I start with the photons, that's kind of one of the reasons, or basically the main reason why we started to think about inversely plan. Um, 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 on the one hand, we need to be able to treat these shapes. So that's where basically how modern treatment planning in a sense evolved and then was translated to also the the the, the shapes that we could also treat with this method um, okay so yes the question is the treatment planning asked when seeing like the forward way cannot do this can we do better and for photons this basically triggered the concept of the beamlet so there was basically um, if you heard the name uh, um, um, Thomas Bordfeld, he was kind of um, um, the the is, is one of the like main persons to talk to about uh, inventing this concept of of the beamlet and um, sub um, subsequently the intensity modulated photon therapy. So these collimators that you we saw early before, they do not need to be confined to the tumor shape. They could also generate beamlets. So you can create any shape you want with them in a sense. And um, so what you can do is just instead of covering the tumor, you could think about little beamlets that you could generate that um, you send into um, the patient. So here, I could basically cover the whole tumor here from this one photon beam with five beamlets that probably are about like one centimeter square of size here, like here in the fluence cross section. Um, so that's something that, that, that you could think of. And you can calculate, pre-calculate the dose of these beamlets with like a dose calculation algorithm. So that's again something that maybe some of you would want that I go into more detail, especially later with the particles. Um, but we will look a little bit into those calculation um, and into the underlying data in the hands-on tutorials. Um, so that's why I do not focus here, but there are like multiple ways to do this. And um, the idea is basically similar for, for um, or they're like the, let's say on the top highest level, the ideas are kind of similar. Um, so you either choose a so-called deterministic algorithm, also often referenced as analytical pencil beam algorithm, where you basically use pre-computed or measured dose curves in water. So you made a simulation in water or, or like even can do the physics um, and um, um, mathematical approximation to compute the dose in water. And when you know the dose in water, you basically use the CT scan to scale it to the anatomy. They are very quick and deterministic. We use them in MATRAD, especially for this tutorial, because you can do them on a home computer, um, but they are not very accurate. An alternative would be to compute the dose of such a beamlet with a Monte Carlo algorithm. So you really stochastically simulate um, or sample how particles traverse the tissue. Um, so you also need to make a lot of assumptions and conversions, like which material are present and so on. Um, but still they are more, often like more accurate in, 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 in especially in heterogeneous anatomies, um, but they are slower. You need to really simulate a lot of particle histories and these, they, these algorithms are like 
outperf outperformed by one or two magnitudes by those. Still, of course, with modern computation where you have clusters and so on, you can get very fast with them in absolute numbers, but you also need more resources. Okay, but what does it help to, to have these, these individual dose, doses computed? We can now basically calculate and modulate our beams with this technique. So for example, um, um, when you had check out these five pre-computed doses, you can just scale their intensity up and down, the intensity of these beamlets um, by attaching weights to them. So let's say you have like some amount of photons coming in and it translates later to particles as well that you, that you normalize to. So let's say 1 million photons or something, I don't know, choose a number um, that's then connected to the machine that you use and so on. But um, you attach weights to them and then you can just say, okay, I want this beamlet here to have a lower weight. So, and then you basically have five weights and this one is one, one, and this one is, I don't know, 0 0.5 and this is one, one, and then you have like a lower dose here. Um, so in principle, this, this allows you to arbitrarily shape your field and your incoming photon fluence. Um, so you see that kind of gets a little bit, increases the degrees of freedom that you have. So you have like a lot of number of beamlets. You don't have like five beams anymore, but you have five beams with each 100 to 1000 beamlets. Um, so this like gets a little bit large. And of course you cannot do this by hand, but you also do not want to do this by hand. Um, so you don't want to sit there and like, okay, I tune this beamlet down because like always when you change something somewhere else, the dose will change and it's, it's, it's not going to work by hand. You can try, but uh, I promise you, uh, um, you will kind of um, fail with this approach of doing this by hand. But um, um, there, um, there comes in again, our idea of the ideal dose distribution. So which we previously tried just by superimposing beams and, and getting a nice dose distribution. Um, we now exploit this mathematical consideration of this. So as I said, like we have like the CT image and the CT image has a lot of voxels in it and it's three dimensional, but you could just write it um, as a vector and the, the superimposing those that you see here um, you would then describe by D star here, for example, and then you have just a vector that is composed of zeros and the prescribed dose, let's be, let it be 60 gray, just within this area. So it's just a vector that has the number of voxels or contains the number of voxels um, and has a 60 everywhere where a voxel contains, uh, belongs to the target. Um, and then you compute the beamlets, like we saw this before, you do like, you have like each of these beamlets, you compute the dose for each one and you put them in a matrix. So let's, this is a matrix D that um, in every column basically that corresponds to a beamlet J has the dose of this beamlet. So it has not the dose vector of the prescribed dose, but the dose like that the beamlet creates. And then you basically have this vector that allows you to weight these beamlets. And this is quite interesting because just by multiplying this matrix with this vector, there's a little bit of math now, but I think it's, it's not uh, the most difficult math. Um, you basically get a dose that these beamlets that you stored in here create, um, given a weight W, like a weight vector W, like all the weights for the beamlets, and when this dose is like is closest or basically optimally exactly the prescribed dose, you have solved your treatment planning problem. Okay, and starting this very simply, um, as a, if you would be like now you're a mathematician or you never heard about um, the difficulties of other things in treatment planning, you can you can approach this with with very simple methods. Um, so how to find the right vector, W, how to find the right fluent setup, the right intensity is, yes, you know, okay, we, we cannot solve that. That's already what we learned. We cannot find a dose that is exactly looks like this prescribed dose with zeros everywhere and 60 gray in the target. So you really 
um, don't have a solution there, but you have you can write this as something you have like this 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 error here that is the deviation of your actual dose from the um, prescribed dose, and if you minimize this, you have the closest approximation to this D star prescription, and you can think of multiple ways to do this matrix inversion I, as, a, as a mathematician. But um, what, what we would like to, to look at, because it allows us directly to, to do some stuff there, like as a straightforward approach to this is to do a simple least squares minimization. So the only thing that we add to this is using penalties. Like we use the matrix here that basically allows us to put a weight on each um, 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 voxel. So we can, for example, penalize an organ at risk higher in this term than, uh, than, than a, a, a target voxel. Um, uh, like an organ at risk higher than the remaining tissue and the target even higher than the organ at risk. That's what I mean. But you see this optimization problem is very simple. We just want to minimize the quadratic differences, which would actually minimize this. And we want to have the option to weight it. We come to this later where this is important. Um, I added some small constraint here. This W should be bigger than zero because we cannot have negative fluences. But this is really the simplest treatment planning problem you can solve. Like basically that's all what it, what it takes to begin with. Like of course, treatment planning is becoming much more complex and we will also evolve this, but really think about it mathematically. That's kind of what you want to do. You can tune this in, in multiple ways and you can add degrees of freedom and so on. But in some sense, it is kind of always close, close to this. Okay, so just to look a little bit into how optimization works. So you can imagine that this function that we then want to minimize this least squares problem for a two dimensional case would kind of look like this. So you have one weight here on the y-axis, one weight here on the x-axis, and this basically circles, they represent the least squares problem. So here's the minimum. Um, here's the, um, and here it gets like basically the values get larger. So in, how do you mathematically solve such an optimization problem? That's just quickly going through how this works because it also helps you understand what happens later. Um, um, so um, basically what you would do is you would start with an initial solution that you would just choose based on some heuristic. So you don't know the solution yet. You just can basically set all weights to one and then start with start with the initial solution. And then you would do an optimization method. And one straightforward way that, that many of you should know about, especially like physicists and mathematicians should know this, is the Newton method. The Newton method is actually a method to find um, um, the root of a function. And you all know that um, if you want to find the minimum, what you can look for is the root of the derivative. So um, that's always a good start. So this, new, this, this Newton method is, is used for finding the, the minimum. So, and what does it do? You take an initial solution um, that, that the initial, initial values here, that you compute the value of the function, you compute the gradient, um, and with the gradient, you find a search direction and a step length. So how this works, that's optimization operations research. There are multiple ways. There are like really intelligent ways to do this. Um, but um, that's basically what is going on. And then you find, okay, it goes somewhat down, but this direction is the best one. And here I find a good step length. And then I do a step. And that's what you call an iteration of optimization. And you go back to step two and repeat this and you go down. And then you will at some point arrive at the minimum. And one thing that is visualized here that in radiotherapy, the optimizer often wants to find solutions that have negative fluences. Because you can think about um, if you could take away dose with negative fluences, um, that would of course give you like a lot more freedom in shaping your treatment plan, but unfortunately you can't. So you need to also find a way, for example, by a projection or something like this um, to adjust your um, um, fluence for for positivity. But that's basically with this tool, you can really now start treatment planning, like simple treatment plans. To be a little bit more precise, 
what is usually done is that um, you choose something that is more suited for large scale problems because we have a lot of weights and for particles this becomes even bigger. We will evaluate in the afternoon how this compares between the photon and the particle world um, to, to understand the, the magnitudes there a little bit. But we usually use something called a quasi-Newton method where we don't fully evaluate gradients and Hessian matrix, as, or especially the Hessian matrix for the second derivative. So, um, so that's like just some, if, if you if you you can you can read read up on this, um, but I won't go into more detail there. Um, and then, like giving our initial problem where we have these five beams, which we now basically cut into fluence beam elements and optimize the weights for them, becomes something like this. So you see, we can now actively start to spare this part just by letting the computer solve this inverse problem. Okay, of course, sounds very easy so far. Um, um, and you just have like this least squares um, um, formulation. So that's of course not capturing everything that there is in treatment planning. But you see there's, there's basically a mathematical understanding of this problem and there are the mathematical tools to solve it. So um, it's really standard optimization in a sense. And the initial treatment planning um, 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 tools, they really use this, like this penalized um, 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 quadratic uh, or this penalized least squares is one of the, or was basically the initial um, kick off of the treatment planning problem. There are other things that you can think of. You can think of linear programming to solve this. You can think about matrix inversion. There's also some papers on there to do this directly, not with a, with a linear least squares algorithm, but all these method, methods are often in some sense equivalent. And this is just like very efficiently implementable, like this least squares minimization approach. So that's why it was one of the first things to do in treatment planning. Okay. So that was basically how we started the treatment planning. We saw that conformal radiotherapy, we just put beams together and superimpose them with photons. It doesn't really work um, for, for um, complex tumor shapes. And then we invented this segmentation of, of the fluences. So let's basically let this, 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 this beamlet elements and, and um, and using this, we then are able to plan treatments that really do optimization, shape our fluence in a way that um, that our dose distribution gets close to the optimal one. But going back, it's obvious it is not the optimal one. It is really like you have those here, you have those here, but we are getting close to that with what is given to us. So we have beam orientations and that what we can achieve. So if you take more beams and so on, then you come to VMAT treatments, um, towards VMAT treatments when you take like a lot of beam angles in a sense and you get closer and closer to the optimal image in a sense, but also treatment time changes, treatment um, robustness changes and so on. So, but that's, that's um, like a little bit an excurs here. Okay. Going to hadrons and, and ions, basically you can also, um, I think uh, Joao Seco, um, I think it was shown like in one or two lectures already, um, like something which I call the old, the old way, the passive scattering method, which is quite close um, to, to, to this initial way of, of doing photons where you basically have your beam and, and you apply um, the full beam to the to the target volume from one direction. Um, that's the passive scattering method. So here your protons basically, um, you, you have your tumor shape and you try um, to cover it completely with one beam and you use two main devices for this, like apart from the, the scatterers and the collimators here, the one thing is the compensator because the, the, um, the ion therapy gives you a new um, degree of freedom, namely depth, that is not really there in photons. Photons always kind of, they always decay exponentially, but ions and protons stop at a certain depth. So basically you need to, to shape the, 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 the beam also in depth um, accurately. So you do this with a compensator device that kind of compensates the shape and then a proton coming in here 
like basically gets a range reduction um, efficiently and, uh, and one getting here gets less reduced at range. So this is actually not completely true what is going on here, I think. So basically this, um, this proton would then have a longer range and this proton would have um, a shorter range. So this somehow makes sense. Um, and um, what you will to, to create several layers of the shape, you will modulate the range with, for example, a range modulator wheel. And this is kind of quite close to this um, conformal way, but due to this possibility of, of shaping this beam um, at the distal edge and so on, you already um, get closer to the, let's say, um, 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 optimal dose distribution just with one beam already. Um, you have then only the entrance channel left and you have these horns here that basically um, uh, just um, um, appear when you are at the, let's say shortest range and basically the layer then through the compensator gets um, also paints this shape in front of the tumor in a sense. Um, of course you could change the compensator but let's not go into like much more details you could do, but that's kind of the old way. But on the other hand, um, um, modulating intensities in, 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 in ion therapy is in a sense also much more intuitive than it is for the photon world. Where in photon world, we need these collimators and we create shapes with them. Um, and the process to make this deliverable is actually much more complex. You need to segment your shapes and so on. And then like the dose looks different, but for um, the ion world, this looks actually is much more intuitive um, in a sense. So for me, it's more intuitive, maybe for, <laughs> for someone else, uh, this is different, but um, in principle, like these accelerators, um, for example, a synchrotron or cyclotron, they kind of produce natural beamlets. You saw it before, what we, what we needed here was a, a, a scatterer because we had like a, a, a proton um, um, actually like a very small proton um, um, beam coming in, which gets then scattered. So it covers like the whole um, um, tumor. But if we do not do the scattering, um, we can really create this individual break peaks at, with a certain energy. Um, yes. Um, just going back to the dose calculation, we can choose similar ideas here. We will look into a little bit into how a dose calculation algorithm works like in the tutorials. Um, and you can do this modulation in depth by choosing different energies or using a, a, um, a range modulator. So how does this look like on our um, um, head and neck case? Um, so if you do not do all the scattering and, and compensating, you basically come out of the accelerator with a quite pristine break peak. So of course there is an energy and an energy spectrum. So this energy spectrum will have also some width of course. So they, they don't produce zero width um, um, energy spectra these accelerators, um, but you actually come out with a beamlet. Okay, so you just can change the energy with a synchrotron that's, that's, that's basically just, uh, just switching um, um, the energy level with a cyclotron um, it's also, oops, so, sorry. Okay, now I have got it. So basically when you look at different energies, which you either can, can generate by energy switching, switching or again, such a, such a range modulator wheel where you basically take away ranges um, and, and, and thus reduce the, the energy um, post wheel of the particles. So you can do this and if you, in, also additionally include scanning magnets. I think the accelerator um, um, speakers will, will go or, um, in, into more detail there. So basically, and if you then use magnets to deflect your beam, you can also cover any position in this, in this target. Okay. And this is basically now just natural beamlets. You can produce them one after one after the other and then do such an energy module, so such a fluence modulation quite naturally just by telling us, give me this energy at this lateral position with this number of, of ions, just to like speak it simply. It's like completely natural compared to, I have to build a collimator with leaves, which then creates me small beamlets and so on. It's quite natural. And um, 
like just comparing this on on a patient example that is also included in 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 MATLAB, you could then think about this looking at like like a modulated plan like this for photons you would have multiple beams coming in um, um, covering this um, this tumor here there's like a lot of structures delineated here but that's i think the tumor and that's the the, the planning target volume will come to that later. And here's like an artificial structure that you use for planning. We will come to that. Here's the heart. Um, here's like the spinal cord. You see the lung um, in the background um, and so on. You see parts of the liver here. Um, and for protons, you can also do this modulation with, with single beams. You could also use um, more beams. But you already see that, um, of course, you are much closer to only irradiating this part, as in photons you always have this like this much stronger dose path in the remaining tissue. It's just like it's not a complete example, but just to 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 give you like kind of a little bit an overview. For carbon ions, what you see is like this dose tail as well. So um, here, like the fragments create, but still, it's much less um, dose path. The entrance channel here is a little bit higher, of course, because this just shows one beam. Um, um, but like already with two beams compared to the five you need with photons, you would you would get quite quite a lower dose. But the principle here to get these doses, like here, is exactly the same as in the photon world. The optimizer does not care for how your beamlet looks like. That's um, that's also something that you that that you should think about. The optimizer just worked with a matrix containing beamlets. So that's really basically an interesting thing um, to, to consider that the optimization and the planning algorithm that is behind the thing doesn't really care about if it's using protons or if the matrix contains a photon dose, a proton dose, or a carbon dose. It's not completely true. There are some things um, that complicate treatment, um, for example, for carbon especially. Um, but um, there will be other lectures covering that. I will just give a few, uh, a small um, outlook on this. So before you go to more complex planning, um, just a little bit going on how do we basically, if we have such a dose distribution or dose distribution like here, how do we analyze this? How do we quantify how good this is? So of course you can just look at the images and see, ah, okay, I'm cover, cover here, cover here. You can also look at statistics. Um, like the mean, maximum, minimum dose. So mean dose is often an indicator used for organs at risk, maximum as well. So you basically differentiate there between like the mean dose is interesting for an organ that we call parallel. So basically um, the lung is a parallel organ because if you destroy a small part of the lung, you still have 95% of the lung functioning. So if you irradiate all of the lung with a high dose, that's bad but a small maximum dose or high dose is tolerable. More than, for example, in the spinal cord, which is a serial organ. So here you would look at maximum dose because if you basically destroy one part of the spinal cord, all that comes further down is also um, lost in a sense because it cannot, um, then the, the, the signals cannot um, transfer anymore. So there you would be more interested in the maximum dose, minimum dose, of course, for target. There are also other statistics um, that, are, that are less sensitive, for example, to cover this. Um, what is also one of the most common things is the dose volume histogram. I will introduce this in the next step that you use for planning. And um, um, complication and control models, which um, I will not cover. That's more on the biology side a little bit and on the statistics side, um, but they are also used in planning mostly to assess the plan quality. I will just give a short like introduction on these two now, because this is, I think, kind of clear um, in a sense. Um, so the dose volume histogram is a very important tool in planning and plan quality assessment because it's a statistic in a sense, but still contains some information about the dose distribution that um, just uh, instead of just reducing it to one value. So the dose volume histogram shows you in an organ that or in a volume that you segmented can be a target or an organ at risk, um, how much percentage of the volume 
is covered by at least a dose level D. So for example, here you would look at, this would be 50, 60, 70, 80, well, quite a large, it's a relative dose, okay, just saw it. But here you would check around the 90% mark of the relative dose you would check and see that a volume of 92% or something like this receives at least this dose. So which, which means basically 8% of the voxels receive um, less dose than this level. Um, and this means that this shape of a dose volume histogram is quite a good shape for targets because it means um, that most of your volume is covered with a high dose. And if this is the prescription, only this part is covered with less dose of the volume. For an organ at risk, you would like something like this. So like something that is close to basically becoming zero everywhere. So that's why this is a very nice shape because you can, a very nice tool, because you can see, you can make a relative assumption on how much volume is, is, is above your threshold, below your threshold and so on. It gives you a statistic and it just is a line, but it still gives you some, some information but while you still lose spatial, you don't know where these voxels are anymore, but you have some spatial information there like some statistical information, not spatial information. And the other tool, the TCP and NTCP models, they relate those to the more biological or thinking. So how probable is it that I create complications in my normal tissue? So for example, for some dose endpoint, this could be maximum dose or mean dose here, you create or you fit to data, usually a function that basically tells you how probable it is to get complications. And you also have this for tumor control that how probable it is to control the tumor. And if basically, if you have these two curves, this gives you kind of a window to derive also your prescriptions. So that's more used um, to, to, to create prescriptions. And you often model this with logistic function, which is then gets to the lyman kutcher Burma model, LKB model, that should basically something to stick in your head or, or ring a bell. Um, recently, they are also often ML AI driven and um, you may use these directly in planning. So you can think I want to minimize NTCP in planning, but more commonly they are used to assess the plan quality, as I said, and to design the prescription. So you now know that when I get like a dose around 60 here, I get 80% tumor control. So I need to probably um, get like a higher dose. If I want to achieve like 90%, I would need to prescribe 65 gray, but then I need to make sure that that like for my, for my organ, I, I go like to some, I, I want to get down, but maybe you would think that something like 40 gray would be acceptable because it's just like one or 2% probability, but getting like, your endpoint becoming 60 gray or something would not be acceptable anymore because then you would be with 60% complication probability. It also then quickly depends on which grade of complication probabilities and is it a curative or a palliative treatment. So there's, that's a curve where you can make quite some um, um, decisions on how to prescribe. So now um, knowing that we can make like these complex prescriptions, um, our initial example of the ideal dose distribution might become a lot more complex. So, um, because when you look at such curves of, of NTCP, TCP and other stuff, you may come up with, uh, with, with much more complex um, um, design ideas for your treatment plan. So you, you will say, okay, for the parotid glands, um, I, correlate the mean dose to the NTCP and I know I want to keep this low as low as possible um, while still I need to achieve a tumor coverage of 60 gray and I really know that the brainstem does not tolerate more than 10 gray this is probably a little bit strict um, 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 but still like I really cannot exceed this number so this might be like a more complex description you will not like if you if you start this now with doing like this 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 least squares approach you will end up tuning these P values, these penalty values quite a lot. Um, and this optimization problem becomes like much more difficult. So what you do then is 
you basically piece together your optimization problem. Your treatment plan planning problem becomes like um, pieced together from different objective functions. So which you need to translate from the prescription. So keep the mean dose to the parotid gland low means you want to minimize something, which is an objective function. And this first objective function then would be like this term. It would be just the mean dose. If you minimize this, you're doing this. The second one, while achieving a coverage with 60 gray in the tumor is also an objective to minimize. And this, for example, you could do with this least squares approach. So here you just minimize the difference to a 60 gray value. The last thing that we saw, do not exceed a dose of 10 gray, would be a constraint for your optimizer. So you would really maybe find a way to enforce this. Um, and basically this would be your maximum volume. And this function looks a little bit weird, but um, since optimization often requires smooth functions, this would be a way to design a smooth maximum here that you can then use to compute also derivatives and so on. So this is like basically ways on how to translate these desires in the prescription into objectives and constraints the optimizer understands. And then you also like have to go to a little bit more difficult optimization methods where I really cannot go into detail. They, they can become quite complicated and people spend a lot of work on those um, um, to get them running. But your optimization problem becomes like pieced together of multiple objective functions, Fn here, that are weighted with these p factors, subject to constraints, and so on. So this just, over the recent years, decades, this has been like people have found objectives, they have found new ways to optimize, they have found new, new things to encode in the optimization. So that's basically the heart of treatment planning and the research of treatment planning is how do I put everything I want to put in my prescription into this optimization? This can be super complex. You can input beam angles, you can input these NTCP models. Um, you, could, you can do basically anything. Um, you can input robustness and so on. Everything can be formulated, um, but everything is basically based on building this optimization problem and optimizing it. So that's just kind of explaining you how you get like more complex and to more realistic and to, to factor in all these decisions, which also shows you this problem with this interdisciplinary approach that you have to factor this in, you have to translate it into a mathematical language. Um, and this makes this problems complex, more complex and complex. It's not like a simple optimization problem, just saying I need to invert this matrix, how do I do it? No, it's like there's other things at play here that you need to translate into math. Okay, and just a quick example of how a treatment plan could look like in terms of a DVH. So here you would have um, minimized the square deviation to a target, for example, using and, and, and would have some objectives on the remaining organs, organs and some constraints on DVH points and maximum dose here on the parotid glands, for example, and the brainstem, the brainstem would have a maximum dose. So basically in the DVH, you would see no dose at all, no volume receiving more than one gray per fraction here. So that's just basically how this then works. And um, you can basically design your treatment plan and assess the quality, see if your constraints are fulfilled and so on. Just one thing I want to say, constraints are not magic. Um, they, they do not solve all your problems in optimization. They create problems because this already was done by a planner who had some experience on what you can achieve. So thinking you coming in as an, let's say inexperienced planner maybe and putting a hard constraint like on the brainstem that is at 0 0.25, the optimizer is really forced to fulfill this. So a constraint is a hard requirement. And then basically all the other objectives that are not constrained like here, this one, they will lose priority. So they will just be fulfilled when this is fulfilled. So they will be, or they get important when this constraint is fulfilled and then you might have a very bad target coverage. So it's really also still a difficult problem despite having us all the tools, it made it more complex. Um, some things are easier, some things are more difficult to fulfill. Yes, and you see as a small summary in practice, you have like the sea of objectives, the sea of optimizers to solve this problem. You have much more complex problems that is really just the dose optimization, as I said, there can be beam angle optimization. You can optimize the shapes of collimators in photon therapy and so on. It's 
it's it's getting increasingly complex from here and research is consistently finding ways of of, of pushing this to its limit um, but uh, this is basically um, like the overview of what you kind of use for basic treatment planning algorithm you need these those objectives that you can plan with and 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 then you can build on top of that okay something that i want to stress what you should never forget treatment planning is always a trade-off because we cannot achieve this um this this dose distribution so um it's always on the first in a trade-off between target coverage and sparing of normal tissues you see this here the stronger i focus on covering the target the wor like the the, the worse gets my um, um, exposure of the organ at risk here and of the remaining healthy tissue. Um, but on the other hand, is also a trade-off between sparing of different organs at risk. So you see here, when I want to take those away, for example, um, from this um, 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 like mouth region, what is exactly the oral part here that is segmented, you have to increase those and other organs or reduce the target coverage as well, depending on how strong you push back this dose. So this animation is um, by someone researching um, um, like other techniques here, multi-criteria um, decision planning optimization with Pareto surface approximation. So this is an advanced technique of planning. And I really can suggest if you want to, to learn a little bit more about uh, planning, I also suggest to visit um, his website. He has very nice animations and, and explanations as well. Um, um, very interesting, interesting stuff there. Okay, so I'm speeding a little bit up. You are, you are, um, you are realizing I only have like 10 minutes left, I think. So the question- have a bit more than that because we started a bit late. Yeah, like it's, yes, yeah, right. It's like 20 minutes, but we still need time for questions. So I'm speeding a little up nevertheless um, and ask this question. Now, do we have fully understood and solved the problem of inverse treatment planning using intensity modulation for photons and ions? Um, I think I mention it so often that this is just kind of the underlying um, um, backbone of on what treatment planning builds on. Of course we haven't, and I want to, um, um, put like your focus on especially two things that are quite important in planning. The one thing is dealing with uncertainties. So that's a fixated patient just imaged um, in like multiple times trying to reproduce the position. So this could be multiple fractions, for example, of the patient. And you see there is variation and this variation in the positioning can amount to like millimeters. So that's really something that is relevant in your planning. It's like when you fixate a patient, you usually do not have like centimeters or, or multiple centimeter problems in the fixation. But you see like even in such a static anatomy as the head, there are differences. Um, this becomes even worse when you go to, to moving anatomies. So there's on the one hand, there's an art of fixating moving an anatomy. So you can use compression and stuff like this or you can gate on the breathing pattern during irradiation. But this is also a problem in planning on the reproduction of the situation. It's, it's a major problem. Um, for the photon world, initially, we came up with basically the concept of multiple target volume. So on the one hand, there's the GTV, which is the tumor volume, the gross tumor volume you see in the image. Like it's this, you see it in the image, you can delineate it. Um, and something that is not really part of the uncertainties I showed now is the is, is then the additional definition of the CTV, which is larger than the GTV and, and includes all the regions where the physician expects um, tumor to be, but not to see it on the image. So I think um, I showed an image of a glioblastoma yesterday that you have like a huge region that is in, which is infiltrated um, which basically you don't see in the first image, you might see it in, in, in diffusion MRIs and so on, but you then would cover this with the CTV so that you make sure that also this regions where, where invisible tissue is. Um, there's also an art to really finding this and, 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 and it's basically knowledge on, on what you need to, something that, that you learn during your um, 
um, uh, medical studies on, on how to define this if you become a radiation oncologist. And the last thing is the PTV, the planning target volume that really tries to take all these uncertainties into account. There's also for moving anatomies often like an intermediate image, the ITV, which just cover the movement of the CTV and then you put the PTV on top, but let's, let's stick with these three. Um, the planning target volume tries to take the uncertainties into account. And so with the photon world, um, people started to design recipes to do that based on expected systematic errors and random errors during the fraction and so on. So this is basically a quite famous recipe by Marcel van Herk, who did it for photons. And you see this, um, this um, light contour is the PTV margin. It's actually not that big um, around the CTV, but if the patient shifts accordingly to your expectations, then it covers like the variation quite well. But for protons and ions, this becomes a really, can become, not always, but it can become a really major problem. So um, because due to this localization of the Bragg peak that you experience in, 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 um, in ion treatment, so you really have this pristine Bragg peak at one position, like any change in the anatomy before, like your Bragg peak can move the position of the Bragg peak. So it's no longer just shifting the patient around and covering the shifting, it's also covering the depth. And this is not very simple with like these generic margin concepts. So you see here on the right, in a changing anatomy, your dose does not stay like this cloud in a sense that shifts across the patient or the patient shift in, in this cloud, but it really degrades completely in certain scenarios. So that's like actually a really difficult um, planning problem. And this will be covered in a short lecture tomorrow where I focus a little bit more on this on how to do this with particles. And we will also look a little bit into how um, um, in the tutorial tomorrow on how this looks like on a patient and how to simulate such such uncertainties. Um, the other thing is the difference in biological effect. So um, this is particularly interesting for, for, for carbon ions, but it's also there with protons. So with protons, you probably often heard like, okay, they are 1.1 times, they're almost as effective as photons or quite close to photons. Usually assume they are a little bit more effective with the factor of 1.1. It's what you use uh, in standard, standard practice. I think um, it was yesterday also mentioned that people are starting to research. So there are multiple models which show that it's not just a constant, it's depth dependent, depending on the LET actually on the and on the um, tissue um, 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 parameters. So, so on the biological tissue, but for carbon ions, this is no longer um, simplifiable in a sense. So when you look at the physical dose of a carbon beam looking like this, I'm here on this liver case and to then factor in all the biology, you end up with some with a biology effective dose if you compare it to the photon world. So if you know, if you come from the photon world and you know this prescript, prescribed dose, physical dose gives a good treatment and then you just use it on a carbon ion beam, you end up with an effective dose that is much more effective at the distal edge of the tumor. So basically, the dose that you see um, see uh, compared to the photon world might be at the distal edge five times as effective, um, depending on the underlying tissue and um, or like here it's like I think three point something, if due to this due to some summation effects and so on, but there is like three three point something is more realistic, depending also on the model and then the underlying tissue. But um, this is basically here. Like you see, it's completely heterogeneous. It has like lower, it is more effective than photons here. It is even more effective here and so on. It seems to be have lower effectiveness in the entrance channel. So you see there's some underlying biology and Hans-Peter Wieser will explain a lot um, um, more, more, um, more, um, um, sorry, a lot more, a lot, lot more insight. Hans-Peter will give a lot more insight into um, uh, this biolog biological um, treatment planning um, problem. Okay, so with this, I want to uh, come to an end and, and afterwards um, answer the question. So summary for treatment planning. So 
In treatment planning, we try to find the best approximation to an ideal dose distribution or more exactly to a prescription that we get. So we have a prescription, we know what we want to achieve in what organ, and then we have to figure out how to set up our machine to do that and how to create a dose distribution that does all that. And there's are multiple factors coming in. So biology, we have to trade off objectives and organs with targets and so on. It's, it's, it's not that easy like in the beginning where we just made this least squares, um, it becomes more and more complex and, and it becomes more and more complex every year of what things you can, can, can put into the treatment planning problem which is also largely collected on uh, largely connected on how our computational systems evolve. So basically the simplest formulation back then took minutes to hours to solve like a least squares problem of this size. And now the solving the least squares problem takes only a few seconds. So you start to think, um, how can I put in other problems that then take again minutes and hours to solve. So like beam angle optimization, um, robustness and so on. Um, the problem is approached, as I said, by optimization techniques, and that's why we call it inverse planning. Optimization is always used, and you want to find the input to a function when you somehow know what result the result you want to get. Um, and um, it's a multi-criteria problem that's also related to the trade-off that lets the planner choose the trade-offs. So really, it's basically might be a discussion with the patient, with the doctor, and so on. The trade-off has to be designed in this treatment plan, and there's not only one solution to your treatment plan. Um, and especially with regards to iron therapy, what we are here about, it has its advantages that basically you have this natural, um, very pristine brack peaks that serve as beamlets and so on, but you also have pitfalls that you need to take care of during planning. In particular, this is biology, and the localization versus uncertainties. And this point, so this point is really massively important for, for, for ion therapy because it, it's really something that whenever someone says, yeah, he, like heavy ion therapy, light ion therapy, head ion therapy, it's so nice because we have the back peaks. Um, you can always kind of say like, strong localization comes with strong uncertainties. Um, that's, uh, that's a problem. Like any change in the anatomy is much more um, um, impactful um, into the, in the planning process um, than it was for the photon world in a sense. And the biology is also something that for the heavier ions um, like the carbon ions is, is, is not fully understood. We have our models. Um, and we try to use them. Hans-Peter will go into detail here. I will go into detail more on this tomorrow. Um, but still, it's, it's, it's non-trivial non problems and they make the planning um, um, process a little bit more difficult or a lot more difficult. Um, but we have like these advantages of the very nice local back peak. We have the beamlets for planning, we, we, the trade-offs become more clear because you, you can spare your tissue much more easier and so on. So that's like my introduction to treatment planning. So I hope that this very basic view on this, so basically how to think about it technically, how to solve it, how to approach this and how to get more complex and build on it um, was a good, um, let's say, intermediate solution that didn't bore all the ones that had um, um, already know a lot more about medical physics, but also was informative and at the same time informative enough for those who have um, have like a background less focused on medical physics. So I'm open to your questions now. Thank you so much, Niklas. That was a really lovely um, uh overview of uh, treatment planning and now we can move on to a few questions maybe you could stop sharing your screen and we will put up the list of questions that we have so far okay yes something i didn't touch today but i will touch tomorrow what are the current requirements for relative stopping power accuracy yeah as i said um um the uh, 
you need to with this the, the, it's quite an interesting question when you lose the use the analytical algorithms or the tabulated algorithms that were measured in water you need this relative stopping power and i said in the beginning it's quite important to remember that your image is based on photons and for protons you don't need photon attenuation you actually need um, ionization potential and and uh, electron density and so on to 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 um, quantify the relative stopping power exactly. And the question is not easy to answer, and I would probably shift it to tomorrow because um, you can create treatment plans with a with a large relative stopping power accuracy, um, which are robust, but then less conformal in a sense. Um, so, or you can try to get very accurate using a dual energy CT and push down this accuracy and, and then you have a more conformal treatment plan. So re, like desirable is a very low one. So if the more exact you have, the, the, the better your treatment plan becomes. Um, but um, probably like um, if you get to 1%, that would be perfect. Um, usual estimate for, for a normal CT to relative if three percent something like this even more maybe um so yeah i think it's it more influences the accuracy or the like the quality of your treatment plan um, because you can factor in this uncertainty but um it it um it is it is um it just like influences the planning and you don't really have a requirement but you would like less uncertainty there and um, which voxel size would you prefer? This also depends on, 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 on multiple parameters. So like planning on the smallest voxel is, is somehow the best, but the question is, do you really need it? It makes your optimization very slow, like to plan, for example, on a one millimeter voxel. Um, those grids are usually taken larger. So you go to three millimeters or something like this. But if you really need to see very localized effects. You can also go to smaller grids, two millimeters, one millimeter, but it depends on the case. Now it's a matrat based question. Um, are the beamlets pencil beams with zero width? No, they depend on the, like basically the tabulated data that you have is usually um, um, combined of an integrated depth dose component and a scattering component assuming an a like a real pencil beam so of zero width but you usually um or you should or you must then then basically um use your 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 air um widening and initial beam width there to to get the right um dose distribution yes it's the beam that only a moderator that enables us to control the dose um, that's quite interesting. In photons, it's really just, it's, it's an artificial construct because you will never create a beamlet. You will really create, you will use it to plan and then create collimator shapes that allow you to, to, to get this fluence that you plan based on the beamlet. For IMPT, it's, it's really a, a real thing happening. It's, it's, it's something that, that you apply. So there is a bunch of protons coming out. They get deflected by magnets and targeted to this this point. So basically there the whole treatment is based on scanning beamlets if you don't use, for example, the if if you don't use a, a, a passive scattering technique or something like this. What is actually the definition of a treatment plan? Yes, it's it's a, <laughs> it's it's interesting um, to define, but it's um, let's say a machine setting, I would say. Um, if you think about it in practice, that gives you a dose distribution that you want to irradiate. Um, it's then it consists of a geometry, um, of a irradiation geometry, of a fluence definition. So basically, something that you can give to your accelerator that that then creates a dose distribution. I would say. Um, what D represent in the objective minimize equation? Yeah, that's the dose. Um, the D star represents the prescribed dose, and D usually represents uh, just the dose. 
Power Particle Collisions Model in Monte Carlo. I'm not a Monte Carlo expert, so I really cannot, um, um, I do not want to comment on this without the fear of saying something that is slightly wrong. Um, it also depends on the code, how much approximation it makes. So I do not really um, um, uh, think about this. Does MADRAT need an implementation of helium oxygen? So helium is already done. Um, oxygen, if someone is interested to do it, uh, I'm happy to, to integrate it. Um, so, but like these MADRAT questions, maybe I answer them um, in the hands-on. So, also question eight, basically, this does not concern MATRAT, but any system, it always depends if you can simulate the dose for the other ion. So, if you have like base data and a machine that you can put into your treatment planning system, you can make a simulation for it. Um, how can I fix moving organ, organs? Um, how can you fix them? Yeah, that's that's a very complicated question, and um, um, it's basically there are multiple techniques that 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 are happening. So you can basically do adaptive treatments. You can use image guidance, which I didn't touch today. Um, I guess like maybe Joao Seco will 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 give a little bit more insight when he talks about cancer imaging. I think tomorrow. Um, about imaging techniques. So that there's a lot of interplay between imaging also on the table during irradiation. So, um, but there's also like sites that you do not really want to treat with, with, with particles already, because especially with carbons, because they are like lung and so on, because they are so moving and it's very difficult to, 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 to make sure that your dose um, lands where you think it should land. Um, so lung is one where you would think twice to use a, a carbon treatment, for example. Do you think LAT-based planning will be important in future years? Yeah, also something I didn't touch on. So, but instead of those, you can also optimize other quantities. So you can optimize LAT, you can optimize um, biological dose and so on. And I think LAT-based planning is a nice simplified alternative um, or like it's, it's, it's sometimes a shortcut to achieve certain things that you could also achieve um, um, with with good models. I, I think it, it certainly will 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 um, will play a role, and it already plays a role in a sense. Um, um, it allows you to do some stuff um, where you can do not have to rely, for example, on your biological model accuracy. Or it also allows you to make your treatment plans more accu accurate. Um, or more robust automatically because you move these 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 um, high LAT regions um, 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 outside of critical regions. But yeah, I mean it depends on on what you want to achieve. It's it's one tool you use for treatment planning, and it will be used and can be used. Um, What does question 13 mean? Uh, it, it's probably not complete. Femtosecond. Um, I don't know if you, you need it um, to scan moving organ tumors because you need to, there's also a speed level you don't really need. Um, so you are not on the, um, um, so what, what you can track is or what people are focusing are two things. They are focusing on, on tracking organs, which is usually done by, by image scans. Um, um, and they try to track the position of the back peak where they use time of flight measurements, for example, and, 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 and uh, some properties of the secondaries produced. So that's the two things, but um, you usually that 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 what we would use. Otherwise, I would not know how to answer this question at the moment. How can we calculate the biological dose compared with the real dose? Yes, that's a topic for the Thursday lecture in the morning. Um, basically, you have models that relate um, your tissue properties to um, to things that happen microscopically and and so on. So this is like something for Thursday. 
Is it possible to, to irradiate tumors from different angles? Of course, um, can just move the angles. I think there was one image of a prostate patient irradiated with opposed angles, um, uh, went quite quickly through it. So that was maybe too quick, but of course you can like, usually you wouldn't choose like nine angles or something like this, like you can do in photon therapy because you don't need that many, but using three angles is, is really, really common. And um, it depends, of course, of what you have, like if you have a gantry or if you have static beam lines and so on, but it's, it's completely normal to use multiple beams. I just use the single beams for, for simplicity here. Yes, is the beam delivered in Matroid in a single direction composed of several beamlets that are just spaced depending on what spacing the user chooses? Yes. So Matrad sets up a, a spot grid, like a scanning grid, and um, these compose the beamlets. We will look in the afternoon on how this looks like in the background. That's what the afternoon session is for. What is acceptable dose percentage of healthy tissue nearby compared to tumor photon, proton carbon treatment? Big question, not easy to answer, depends on 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 this on the site on the organ on on other things like as i said planning factors in a lot of decisions and trade offs and you cannot just fix a number and say that's what i want to achieve something about cobalt 60 gamma rays i have no experience really with cobalt 60 um, um i think by now it has almost um, like modern treatment does not include cobalt 60. There's like the exception of 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 an MR um, cobalt 60 device that was um, um, developed by ViewRay. But um, yeah, I cannot really comment on on cobalt 60 too much. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Nicolas, for 